you know, Valentine's Day is coming up. And we're already in this sign of Aquarius. And uh, I'll be 71 you know, in about a week and a half. Um, so this is a Valentine's Day poem. Because people have been asking me lately, how are you doing? How are you doing? And I tell them, um, I'm lovesick. I'm lovesick. I'm um, dealing with the last great love, <clears throat> the last great love of my life. So I may be reading a few things about that. Um, so this is a, a Valentine's Day poem for the person that I'm lovesick for. I want to buy you a dozen roses. I want to buy you chocolate. I want to buy you champagne. I want to feed you caviar on the tip of my dick. <laughs> hey, I'm gonna bring a tequila, you know? Mike, want some tequila? Oh, yeah. <laughs> in my youth, in my youth as American soldier, I was arrogant enough to volunteer to expend my time in harm's way to return to Vietnam. Folks said to me, are you fucking crazy? I was crazy by then, but just didn't know it yet. At the crossroads in Kuchi village lay two dead bodies, decaying in the heat. I had never seen corpses before without coffins or holes in their bodies. The sight was so vivid, it remains with me still. Blink think. Now, growing up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, we're totally different than growing up in Philadelphia. Pittsburgh is the beginning of the Midwest. Um, we had certain morals and values that didn't seem to exist here in Philly. <laughs> but this is called blink think. They gone. Those hipsters and dipsters cut you with a razor before you could blink. Pull a pistol quicker than you could think. Friday and Saturday night cats who lived in sonic universes of jazz and big swing bands. Suited and zooted under wide brim hats. Shoes so shine they turned night into day. That was their way. I had an uncle that, God help you if you stepped on his shoes. Okay? <laughs> he was a World War II veteran. Of Norman. Thank you. Thank you. For poetry. Um, I just spent I spent five hours with Sonia Sanchez and I would ask all of you to send her positive healing energy. Some of you just turned 85 years old. Yeah. And the last my last conversation with Larry Robin was that she had fallen a couple times in her home. And that's what happens to you. When you reach your late sixth to seventh decade, early seventh decade, when you go to the doctor, the doctor always says, Have you fallen lately? <clears throat> and every time I have to tell my doctor, yes, I had, a, I had a bad fall in my house. In the aged poet's home, Harriet Tubman had just moved in. Sojourner Truth arrives next week. And Zynga has been there forever. For Sonia Sanchez. They will come. They will come. They will come, who share your bloodline. They will come, those ancestors who warred against those who would annihilate. They will stand at the door of glory, be the first to greet you if you've upheld their standard, if you've loved your own enough to go into battle.
You were such a bright boy, bright in intellect, bright in complexion, bright in passion. You were a star in a strange galaxy, vivid in magic, vivid in understanding, vivid in compassion, vivid in outrage, vivid in loyalty, vivid in passion, vivid in danger. So this is new work that I've been writing, going through my lovesickness. I'm going to travel back in time to speak with Emily Dickinson of her rhyme. I'm going to enter her room on a night of the full moon, kiss her on the forehead, and whisper in a dream of what her words will mean. I actually have been to um, Emily Dickinson's house, and uh, the poem that came out of that, which I believe is in my book, uh, Crowns and Halos, found the house of Emily, stood in her bedroom door, marveled at the light she left, polishing the floor. I even buried a quarter in her grave. I have dirt from Emily Dickinson's grave in my house. I have dirt from Harriet Tubman's grave in my house. I have dirt from Chris Attic's grave in my house. Mama had a mole on her third eye. She would lower her head toward her chest, better positioning that eye to read you in 30 seconds. She would have downloaded your entire life, knowing you better than you knew yourself. My sister could do the same and also see ghosts. My granddaughter has my mama's gift, knowing how to read you in a heartbeat, and then deciding whether you are good or evil. OK, so I can't forget about you. Is that what you want? That is what you want, right? Nightly, I remember how we operated in the dark, how I look forward to having you share my bed. How long was our love? Twelve years. If I were you, I would have never left. But you are you, and I am me. I've gotten to this, um, I've just read, uh, I'm just finishing up the, the Holy Bible for six times, reading it from cover to cover. This is my sixth time, like in another week I'll have it done for the sixth time. All right. it, is in, it is in the watches of the night that I most remember your heat, your body next to me in bed. I'm an old man, but you are young and viral, muscled with manhood. I salute your courage to love me, to take me in your arms, to go down on me, to allow me to enter your rooms through a rabbit hole. No one has ever pounded me as passionately as you. You live in my blood at this moment and forever. Langston you said that a poet must hang themselves with their own words. When I first, um, when my sister, my late sister, read about me being at a gay rally and writing these protest poems against Rafferty and uh, some other, oh, and Longstreth, and when that appeared in the Daily News and my sister read it, she killed me off for the next five years. My daughter would call her, my daughter's mom would call her and she'd say, don't call me about him, he's, been, he's dead and buried as far as I'm concerned. coming up in the election year. What if the president was music? The nation would elect music to the White House for four years. The population would elect a genre of music to serve for four years. No secret service necessary. No press secretaries, no armored limos, no Air Force One, just 24-7 music. No political parties, just music. A friend of mine, fellow poet, 
who's buried at least uh, who's buried at least four people, four intimates, said this to me: "Start with beauty, and then tell the truth. Start with beauty, and then tell the truth." Miles Davis was royalty. Who else would turn their backs on their fans? Miles was so deep, he was ancient. From what I hear, he was the only one in the world who could arrive at James Baldwin's house in France at any hour of the day or night and announce, I'm here. <laughs> it was a dark matter and always will be. I attended the funeral of James Baldwin. James Baldwin was a friend of mine. And I talked to him three weeks before he passed and told him how much I loved him. And Jimmy said this, if you don't know my name, you don't know your own. Jimmy, I know you heard your mama's moans in, at your funeral in St. John the Divines in Harlem. For those of us who loved you, it shredded our hearts. What were the odds, given your origin, that you would die so famous? Your humble mother, astonished at her child. There are many definitions of a poet. And um, one of the definitions, if you do a cross-cultural examination of poetry, one of the definitions is a truth teller, a prophet, a saint, a madman, a mad woman, a troublemaker, an outlaw, a shame. This is called a shaman's vow. Send me the lonely ones, the haunted beautiful ones, the wounded ones the mad ones, the misunderstood ones. Send me the ones whose outside is not their inside. Send me the ones with stories, with poems, paintings, photographs, music. Send me the ones scarred by war. Send me refugees and immigrants. Send me outsiders and insiders. Send me the dead and the living. And one of the things about being a shaman is that uh, you communicate with not only people in 3D, but in 5D, or 7D, or 10D, or whatever. When spirits walk on legs of whirlwind, shrieking their agony, what can we do but pray? When fires abandon order and run through the forest like children, what can we do? Of course, we all know about what's happening in Australia. Um, but you also have to understand that given the legacy of the West, given the legacy of slavery, Amiri Baraka, before he died, said that from the West Coast of Africa to the East Coast of the United States, on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, is a river of a railroad of human bones. <clears throat> so if you watch these hurricanes and storms come off the coast of West Africa, they follow the routes of the slave ships and go right into those ports where slavery was most vicious. I wrote a haiku for Jimmy Baldwin. Um, it took me 19 years to meet him, but I was reading him all through my teenage years. And uh, you did not call him Jimmy unless he gave you permission to call him Jimmy. And he gave me such permission. I was raised very properly. I used to say, in referring to Gwendolyn Brooks, Miss Brooks, Miss Brooks, Miss Brooks. And one day Gwendolyn said to me, Lamont, call me Gwendolyn. I said, but you're my elder. She said, I realize you have good <coughs> that were colleagues call me Quinn. The night I met Jimmy Baldwin was an African, was an Andean peak of my existence. 
The ancestors surrounded me in Vietnam. Hand laundry here for Mama and Aunt Minnie. In Pittsburgh, we say Aunt, we don't say Aunt. We say streetcars instead of trolleys. For Mama and Aunt Minnie, hand laundry here was the sign in the front living room window of my Aunt Minnie's house, where much of my childhood unfolded. Weekly, white men would bring their soiled linen to the house for Aunt Minnie's care. Sometimes, if they caught my younger brother and I nearby, they'd give us each 50 cents or a silver dollar, as if, as they left, returning to their Cadillac at the curb. Every day, Aunt, Minnie's crippled, Aunt Minnie, crippled by arthritis, would begin her washing, her ironing, culminating in hanging the wash out to dry on clotheslines in the backyard. This would all take place before her afternoon TV romances would come on. She'd fix herself a highball of whiskey and squirt, squirt before settling down to relax. Aunt Minnie was the grandmother we never had. Aunt Minnie was Mama's first cousin. Their fathers were brothers. Larger than my tiny mom, she did all she could to keep her widowed cousin in her struggle to raise four children. During those days, when as Mama said, you're eating your white bread now, son. We lived a, gorgeous, a glorious childhood of play and school and dreams, protected in a bubble of Christmas love, Christian love, and punishment. We were as terrified of the old folks as we were of our mighty God and lightning. The elders spied on me out, the elders spied me out with my ever present head in a book, telling me, you stick with those books, boy, you stick with those books. And I did. And I did. And I did. Not every poem will be a diamond. But every poem will touch, teach. Every, not every poem will be a diamond. But every poem will teach how to achieve that reach. The language of the oppressed is always more interesting than that of the oppressor. Yeah. One day they are suddenly gone, those lovers with whom you've shared saliva and sperm. It always takes days or months or years to recover from such a disconnection until finally there is no one to share bed or passion with. You continue your journey on an empty sea, in an empty bed, to a land of ghosts. And you know that somebody around you was always humming. Somebody around you was always singing hymns. Somebody around you was always saying, was always speaking in riddles. They was teaching you how to resist. They was teaching you how to struggle. They was teaching you how to overcome. They was teaching you the deep science of quantum physics, the mysteries of Africa. They was teaching you 
what moaning was all about. Voice of the oppressor. Starve them. Oppress them. Murder a few in thousands. It will create genius. Mama gave me a PhD the moment I told her I wanted to go to college. <laughs> Don't be no educated fool, son. What do you mean by that, mama? You'll find out. The most important thing is to have common sense. I done forgot what you got to learn. Thanks, mama. Thanks. I had to literally threaten some of my professors at Temple University. I had to tell them I just got back from Vietnam. And I had to tell them, look, if you don't let me out of your class because you're so racist, I'm going to come back and I'm going to fuck you up and send you to the goddamn hospital. Yes. One professor in uh, a 300, 300 of us in the, in, the, in, the, in the room, 20 of us black, and he stops himself in the middle of his professing and says, oh yeah, by the way, this is a very racist industry. So if all you black people want to get up and walk out now, that would be good. You ain't got it going on until you can say, Alexa, who is Lamont B. Steptoe? <laughs> you ain't arrived until Alexa knows your name. Alexa knows my name. <laughs> so buy my books. <laughs> okay, um, just a few more. I wanted to read this poem that appeared in this anthology that Larry Robin put out, Moonstone put out, in, in honor of Mary Baraka. And I used to go to Baraka's house uh, once a month for 10 years. And the first time I rolled up in his house, he said to me, uh, how old are you? I said, 47. He said, you know there ain't no spring chicken. <laughs> and the second time, he said to me, and asked me about my Vietnam service, um, how many people do you kill over there? And I said, you know, my job in the military was a scout. I said, none that I know of. My job to find them. And let other people do that. Amiri, Lamont be stepped up. You ain't here no more. But your voice is, your image is, your fire is, your genius is, your beauty is, your truth is, it ain't gone nowhere. You out there with the gods. You are wind, sea, sunshine, stars, comets, asteroids, black holes. You out, 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 and out. You deep understanding, star seed, black thought. You running with a posse of jazz, of blues, of dudes with views. You wizard now, Obed man, magician, mojo, sorcerer. We who knew you are blessed, advanced, quantum comrades. You conquered lions of deception, as fierce as Sonia Sanchez, a child of Baldwin, an emperor of Etheridge Knight. The alphabet is a flame in your name. Like you said, we own the night. Ancestor, too deep for your time. Folks plotted on you like you was Jesus. I had to threaten a motherfucker who spoke of harming you. I had to threaten a motherfucker who spoke of harming you. Amiri, you rolled like the waves that brought our ancestors to North America. You were all the storms they weathered, all the waves that thundered, all the lightning strikes that boiled the sea. You were the madness, vivid as blood. You danced, you sang, you ranted, you scattered, you drummed, you wailed, you pronounced, you decreed, you God-seed. You always had matches in your hands. 
dynamite in your back pocket. You evolved into a light so bright, it would take my sight to see you now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm going to get out of here. And I thank you for, um, for being here tonight for Sean and, and what Bob Zell do and does. And it's very important to keep the word alive because we are living in a time where, you know, Dennis Brutus, South African poet Dennis Brutus was my mentor. And South Africa, Dennis Brutus was responsible for having South Africa banned from the Olympics for 42 years. And Dennis taught me that endurance, writing is endurance. It takes endurance. Writing is a long distance run and requires stamina and endurance. At the height of his banning by the state of South Africa, if you were in the same room as Dennis, you automatically had a year in prison. Automatically. When Dennis died, he was my mentor for 22 years. When Dennis died, his story was in every major newspaper around the world. If you don't know Dennis Brutus, find out about him. So those of us who went to Vietnam, you know, I mean, I was in Temple University. And you want to know what caused me to go to Vietnam? What caused me to go to Vietnam was the assassination of Martin Luther King. I'm in the library all day at Temple University, working on a term paper. And the subject of my term paper is comparing and contrasting the life of Gandhi and King. And I walk out of the library at 8.30 that evening, and someone walks up to me and says, did you hear what happened? I said, no, I've been in the library all day. They said they killed Martin Luther King. I went back to my apartment at Broad and Dolphin, stayed up all night weeping, listening to the radio, black radio stations eulogize King, and all hell was breaking loose in North Philadelphia. The next day, all the black high school students walked out of school and marched to Independence Hall. And I went with them. And we heard speeches. And I watched the white parents drive in and pick up their kids and drive them back to the suburbs. And literally over 50 or 100 of my classmates tried to talk me out of volunteering for Vietnam. My English professor said to me, Lamont, I know you're romantic, but those are very real poems. And I said, I'll be fine. Another friend that I had met over that summer, who worked at Strawberries and Clover before I started my freshman year, he had been in the Battle of the Idrang Valley. He took off his shirt and showed me seven bullet holes in his back. And he said, you want this to happen to you? And I said, that's not going to happen to me. And he said, be stupid. I'll tell you one thing, Vietnam is going to make you cry for your mother. And that part came true. Booted and forested. Booted and forested, we fell from the sky like stones. Our mission to the preserve democracy of bone. Children, we were puppets on the fingers of old men whose wealth bought stealth. How could we know we were torching the robes of our lives, eating the strawberries of nightmares, lost in a land that hated our footprints and cut our throats with a wind? Thank you.